working week this week, good news for shoppers in Nottingham. The number of empty shops in the city is down. We want to see small units filled with small businesses who can grow and be successful in Nottingham in the future. I'll be meeting the guys making a living from fixing your technological problems. We see lots of ones that have been down the toilet and stuff like that. Ones that have been run over by cars, iPads that have bent in half. <laughs> managed to get them up and running. And the charity shop that's selling sports goods. A lot of people see sports out there on the TV and want the opportunity to take part. Sports Trader gives them that opportunity at a grassroots level. And in a few moments time, Des, I know you've been waiting for this. Oh. We've been eating these. Oh. What are you, a leprechaun? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for Robin Hood, it's not working. <laughs> it is, mate, Robin oh, Hood. Robin Hood's good. Oh, we'll be explained in a few moments here on Working Week. You sure we're leprechaun? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Working Week, I'm Rob Pittam. I'm Des Coleman. And have you noticed Des, city centre, pretty busy? Yeah, it's chocker. Absolutely rammed again. And that might be down to the fact that the City Council has got a new scheme to reduce the number of empty shops right across Nottingham. There's some more cuts down. Bringing new life to city streets recovering from the recession. Wired Cafe in Pelham Street is the brainchild of Trey Gretton Roche who gave up a career as a psychotherapist to set up in business. <laughs> right, well, um, it was kind of a dream, really. I was uh, 20 years I worked as a psychotherapist, and uh, for quite a lot of the years at the end of that, it was always about kind of, you know, I don't know, just having a, a dream and thinking everyone else had one to either set up a B&B &B by the sea or a cafe, you know, everyone had that. And then it kind of got to the point where I thought, actually, maybe I just need to do it and uh, so I did so it was two years in the planning actual planning before we opened the doors and that was two years of research and kind of doing all the numbers and just trying to make sure whether this was a dream that could actual, actually have some viability in reality or whether this was just a pipe dream so it was two years planning wired the business is trying to bring an East London cafe culture to Nottingham's creative quarter offering customers high-speed connectivity and unusual drinking experiences. I got the spiced chai tea, so I got a nice big pot. Was it good? Yeah. It sounds nice. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about this little timer? Um, so basically, well, she put the little pot down and then she put the timer in yeah. it, and I was a bit confused. But um, with the tea you get, um, it's basically to find out when it's perfectly brewed. So mine was three minutes, and when the sand ran out, that's when I poured my tea. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, hi, Kay, this is Trey here from Wired Cafe Bar. Um, can I put my order in for Saturday? So and after all those get... years of planning, it's a dream that's beginning to pay off. It's been incredibly hard work, but at the same time, because it's been something that I've just wanted to do, there's been this passion behind doing it. It hasn't felt like hard work in the way that, you know, doing something that you hate doing feels like hard work. So it's been... I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I'm working now, but at the same time, I'm loving what I'm doing. So it's hard, but it's not hard, if you know what I mean. It's been a steep learning curve, and some surprising problems have cropped up as the business has grown. I think the biggest difficulty has been staff, and I really didn't think it would be. I think, given that I worked with people for 20 years, I kind of consider myself quite a communicative kind of a person. I, I thought that the staffing would be easier than it, than it is, and uh, finding the right people that share some sense of the passion that goes behind Wired, because this has never been a place that has just been about let's see if we can make a quick buck or let's, you know, it doesn't matter about the quality. It really, really matters to me how everybody experiences this place. And trying to get staff who have some sense of things mattering, you know, the little details matter. That has been really difficult, but I feel like the people that we've got now, I'm delighted with really, and I want that to continue. It's really good. It's very fast paced. Uh, I get a lot of responsibility for what I do and um, it's very rewarding, there's lots of loyal customers, it's a big family here. It's one of a new generation of businesses taking over empty shops across Nottingham. According to the City Council, the number of unused premises in the city is at its lowest level for five years. 
and Trey was helped by a city council scheme to help fill up vacant shops. The city grant scheme, the vacant shops grant, was incredibly important to us when we first started. So it's virtually a year ago to the day that we came in and took the keys to Wired. And this was an empty shop that hadn't been open for two and a half years. So you can imagine the kind of state that it was in. It certainly wasn't fit for purpose for a cafe. So we had to do all of the infrastructure work, all of the plumbing, all of the electrics, to get it into a place where we could then put a cafe in here and without the vacant shop grant that would have been incredibly difficult because what they helped us with was to put the infrastructure in so they gave us money for electrics for the plumbing for the bits that really would have pushed us to the very edges of our budget according to the council its vacant shops grant means that 13% of city centre shops are currently empty and that's down from a peak of 18% last year. So how does the scheme work? Alice Ratcliffe has been speaking to City Councillor Nick MacDonald to find out. The scheme works by investing in the bringing into use of a unit, so we're not just giving businesses a cheque, we're asking them to demonstrate that they're actually doing that and they're um, starting a new retail unit in an unused uh, shop. So how would you go about signing up for this scheme then? There are details available on our website. Um, if you register your interest with the council, we will call you, we will make, it, um, make the effort to come and speak to you and, and find out what it is you need. Uh, we try and take a very personal approach to this, every business is different um, and the way in which we've been successful in Nottingham in the last couple of years with vacancy is by taking a very bespoke personal approach to each business. And why is it the council is doing this scheme? Shouldn't you be leaving this sort of thing up to the private sector? I, I think if we left this sort of thing up to the private sector we wouldn't have vacancy falling in the way that it has been. I think there's a place for the council um, playing a role in, in making a city centre successful. This is one of the ways that we can do it. This is match funding, we're not giving all the money, we're asking businesses to invest as well. Um, but actually it's made a big difference in Nottingham, it's made a difference to the city centre, I think. It's a new flagship store for a very new idea. Sports Trade is a national charity that's chosen the Broadmarsh as the base for its most important shop. These are a new line just come in, what we want to do is promote these. All of the profits from here will go directly into helping sport in Nottingham. Ten pounds a pair. The charity concentrates on helping people with disabilities or from disadvantaged backgrounds. Sports Trader is, you can just do anything if you put your mind to it, whether you're from a disadvantaged background, you're disabled, black, white, you can just, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything to achieve. I think that's the motto. <laughs> It's a simple idea, the store gets stock donated from some of the biggest brands in the country and sells it to raise money which is ploughed back into local sports clubs and facilities. Hopefully the local community will benefit from it. Not only are they getting goods at great prices, they're also knowing the money that's donated through the charity is going back into grassroots in their local community and helping the kids at all ages develop their sporting skills. Cabrini Sports Direct, they've donated a lot of stuff for us, which is very generous. Speedo, nice local company, they're going to be donating some more. Uh, they've been very generous. And then at the back there we've got Cougar, we've got the Cougar Rugby Boots, they're great tops, they've been kind enough to donate all of them to us. We've got Kicker Shoes here as well, so even for kids who want school shoes, we've even got them. Uh, great prices, £15 for kids and £20 for adults, that's all we're asking, brand new. Many of the staff here are volunteers dedicated to the cause. It's fun because everyone here is just enthusiastic and everyone's here is like happy like every day. So you've got that atmosphere and as well it's like for a good cause. So when you come in you just know like at the end it's even though like you're not getting something out of it, something is being done about the shop. It's also another example of a new store opening up in a vacant shop. But isn't there a danger that selling reduced price sportswear will hit other businesses in the city? The orange and black is a very popular range of colour. Dominic Corder is from the Nottingham Institute, a network of some of the biggest organisations and businesses in Nottingham, which aims to coordinate work between companies, colleges and charities. I don't think it's about damage, I think competition's a good thing. I think by opening up multiple stores within an area is actually very good. I mean, on a completely different scale, we have the Indian Quarter in Nottingham, which is a load of Indian restaurants all together, and they all do well, because each place offers something individual, and I think that's the key about the sports shop and sports trader. It is something that's never been done before. 
and there was no hesitation from customers visiting the store. I'm coming for a pair of walking boots and I found my favourite brand which is Kerrymore and that's them there and I can't believe the price. They're such good value for money compared to what I normally pay. So how much are they? They're just under £20. Unbelievable. Not everyone though was there to buy the kit to play sports. I'm simply in here looking for some tops to wear in bed <laughs> with my shorts as a pyjama top and this sort of thing is, is ideal. Uh, I, at my age at 84 I don't do a lot of sports today <laughs> but uh, I'm still active in bed. <laughs> It's perhaps not quite the market the charity was expecting, but it has big hopes for its Broadmarsh store and wants to use it as a base to open up more shops around the country, as well as putting money back into the sports community here in Nottingham. That's it for now, and you're laughing because you know what's coming up. It's the hats, isn't it? But before that, before that, we'll be hearing from a man who's making a business out of curing your technology problems. We even had a gentleman who dropped it off a block of flats just round here, come round to retrieve his iPhone from the bottom and walked past us. <laughs> we managed to get up and run in for him. And I'll be finding out what your costly technological problems are. My iPhone, because it just broke. Use laptops for work and stuff like, and schoolwork, and it just crashes up when you really need it, and that's annoying. And of course, here we go, Des. Da -da 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 -da. We'll be talking to a man who makes bow and arrows in Sherwood Forest. I feel like singing a song, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, right through the glen. <laughs> Copyright, don't go anywhere near that. No, stop now. You never saw that. Welcome back to Working Week. And uh, I think it's time for the hats, mate. It is. Put the hats on. Put the hats on. Because, Take it away, Des. Yeah, because we've been to meet a man who makes a living out of making bow and arrows in Shitwood Forest. And we only did that so we could wear these hats. Yeah, they suit us, don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's one of the oldest crafts in the world. And getting a touch of new technology here in Nottinghamshire. It's a skill that it doesn't come natural, you've got to learn it. It's a lifetime's apprenticeship in making a bow that will suit somebody's hand. People have said that, did I make bows for Robin Hood? Probably another lifetime. First of all, it bends into the bow, then it bends around the bow until right, okay. it straightens up. But this, this is an aid to help it straighten up. An aid to accuracy. Indeed. Okay. Well, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your help. No worries. KG Archery sits in the heart of Sherwood Forest. It's been around for 25 years and it's the only professional bow making company in England. It's keeping a tradition alive that's been around since before Robin Hood. The company's founder, Keith Gascoigne, has been making bows and arrows for more than 50 years. It's a rare skill. So this bow looks like it's almost finished. What's going to happen next with this now then, Keith? Right, well this is a Minerva mm -hmm. and that's the goddess of handicraft. Oh. Now the next thing we've got to do is wait for the customer coming along because I will actually reduce, it's a lady that's going to buy this bow, so at the moment that is uh, 1.48 uh -huh. And that's for a gent's hand. Right. So she will come along and hold the bow and I will reduce it so it fits her hand nicely. Wow. And that's what it's waiting for. So it's custom made? It's custom made, yes. Brilliant. And do you do that with all your bows or is that...? Not with all the bows, but uh, when somebody's got a particular style of handle they want to fit their hand, mm -hmm. then we actually do this for them. Wow. Can we have a look at how that will look when it's...? Yes. See, what I'll be doing is fitting their hand uh -huh. So I shape the bow until it's nice at full draw mm -hmm. for the lady to shoot the bow. Keith has a team of skilled bow makers that he's trained himself. He reckons it takes decades to produce a master bow maker. Is that not quite all right here? So look. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. The workshop is a mixture of old and new technologies. Much of the work is done in the traditional way. But the company has pioneered the use of carbon materials to make the bows lighter and stronger. Things have changed from days of Robin Hood, 
when they were using all wood bows. A modern bow has in excess of 700 g-force going through the structure and that's why I created the carbon bows there and that can take the actual shot wave because it's 700 g-force in literally a fraction of a second. And in slow motion video you see things turn into jelly. And this is how I've developed over the years the carbon bow handle. And we were the first company to go in production with an old carbon bow handle. Other people have tried and not been successful, but we've been successful from day one. As a result, the bows and arrows made here are in demand all over the world. One customer in the shop today has travelled from Norway. Real, real problems getting good quality supplies of archery equipment in Norway. So I've got a bow and I came down to get a few other bits and pieces from here. So very impressed. Uh, Sherwood Forest, I knew I'd get something good down here. So I've had a set of arrows put to my size, my specification. I couldn't ask for anything more. It was really good. Yeah, this is our Osprey. Mm -hmm. And this is our best-selling bow. We're averaging one a day. Selling one, one of these One a of day. these a day, yes. Wow. See, there's a picture of the Osprey. Yeah. It's and lovely. It was just my vision of the Osprey floating around looking for its supper. So the actual shape of it? Yes. That of an Osprey. I can see that, actually. It's lovely. Mm. It's a little known fact, but somewhere on the legal books, there's still a law that means that everyone in England should practice how to use a bow and arrow or pay a fine. But even without that, archery is still growing in popularity. Demand is increasing tremendously. And I think a lot's due to the publicity that we've had in the previous Olympic Games. When we had two ladies in the Paralympics using my equipment and came back with gold medals in the team section. We also had my bows in the main Olympics as well. So as a result of that, do you think there are more people getting into archery nowadays? There's more people getting into archery but not staying in archery because people are more flippant and want to do different things. Archery is to be dedicated to learn the art of drawing, holding, pointing and loosing. And a lot of people want the quick fix and they're just not doing it. You place your bow arm Which out. sounds like my cue to target. give it a go. Now lift the bow arm and remember where I told you to place it, that's good. Yeah. And draw it to Keith's your wife, Christine, Don't is an archer string, who helps to train nice Olympic stunts. athletes. The cock feather is the odd coloured one, uh -huh. and that always goes outermost from the bow. Right. So it goes in between the knocking point here, rests on the arrow rest here, mm -hmm. and you use three fingers, one above and two below. So there. And there. And there. A little finger and thumb totally and utterly relaxed. Now you point out with the bow. Mm -hmm. Rotating that elbow so you don't hurt yourself. Yeah. Right into your face, if you can draw it into your face, that's good. Point it down a little and let go when ready. Well done. Well done. <laughs> yes. That's really good. OK, so the same again. So Not bad for a beginner, but my task was made a bit easier by the lightness and strength of the bow. Well done. Robin Hood would have been jealous. And let go when ready. The modern bow, compared to what my ancestral <laughs> archer would have used in Robin Hood's time, is the, the draw weight. He would have had to use the bow in excess of 90 pounds in draw weight, and a war bow typically 150 pounds in draw weight. And that was to launch very heavy arrows. The modern bow, um, we don't need that sort of weight because the amount of energy that's stored within the structure enables you to shoot a lighter arrow. So that typically uh, a draw weight for a modern archer would be 38 pounds for a man, even less for a lady. And we can easily reach you know, two or 300 yards and with no problem with lightweight bows. And I'm sure that uh, Robin Hood would give his back teeth for such a bow that could pick the Sheriff of Nottingham off at his castle. Well, Alice, I think that for the first shot is very, very good. You've got a gold there, a red, and a red. So that scores nine, that scores eight, and that scores seven. Wow. So well done for the first attempt. And we can see. Uh, Nottingham's got a growing reputation for high tech businesses. Here on Working Week, we've been inside the information company Experian, and we've seen the fast growing Ascendex, also based in the city, 
which handles texting messages for businesses around the world. Oh, where would I find that? And Retail Assist deals with technological breakdowns for shops across the country, all from its Nottingham city centre office. Do you want to um, give it a test now? They're all businesses which have grown on the back of our love of new technology. OK, thank you, bye. But what about the nuts and bolts of it? What happens when our smartphones and our tablets break down? <laughs> Dares has been finding out your technological nightmares. I'm with Kia. Kia, what's your worst technological disaster? My worst technological disaster has got to be my sat-nav. Um, it takes me to the wrong place sometimes, and I'm not like people that they don't, do you know, some people don't need sat-navs, they'll use the maps. I cannot use the map. I'm really bad at directions. I need to have my sat-nav. The worst thing is when it lets me down, all the battery goes. Um, yeah, that has got to be the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> your worst piece of, of technological... Um, my iPhone, because it just broke. Because it was on the sink and it just went fuzzy for no reason. So I'm guessing it's my iPhone, because I think it's really bad in making. You think a little bit of water got in there? No, no I don't. I think it was just on the sink and it broke. That's what I tell my mum. My computer's really bad. Why? They run, it runs really slow and like it freezes a lot. So when you try and do like, especially work, because use laptops for work and stuff like, and school work, and it just crashes up when you really need it and that's annoying. So a technological breakdown looks like a secret nightmare many of us share. And one Nottingham business is growing quickly on the back of carrying out repairs you might never have thought possible. We see lots of ones that have been down the toilet and stuff like that, ones that have been run over by cars, iPads that are bent in half, um, managed to get them up and running. We even had a gentleman who dropped it off a block of flats just round here, come round to retrieve his iPhone from the bottom and walked past us. <laughs> we managed to get up and running for him. James Pink set up Ilpard when he was working at university. Fixing things is in the blood. His parents ran an electrical repair shop and he got into the business by fixing computers, but now specializes completely in Apple products. Initially, we used to do about 10 units a week when we first started, which was sort of nicely manageable as a student. Um, and then sort of since we've had the shop every year um, it seems to have doubled in sort of trade and turnover and it's sort of slowly increasing as we sort of get bigger it, it grows quicker as well so it's grown nicely. It's an impressive growth especially when you consider the location tucked away in an alley at the back of the lace market it's not exactly a spot with a lot of footfall and for many years it was a lonely life as an independent trader. For a long while I was sort of the only person that I knew that ran an, an independent business in Nottingham but as time's gone by sort of more people that I know have set up their own businesses and I've met people that run independent businesses in Nottingham so it's quite nice to be part of that sort of community especially in like the creative quarter now it's sort of really taking off. James has taken on two apprentices to keep up with the growing demand and has some useful advice for anyone looking to set up in business. Just plan it properly and think about how much it, it's going to cost to get your initial start up because we came very close when we first started to actually having to sort of pull the plug on it because there was no money left. Um, so, But if we had planned that then we could have said oh right okay let's not spend the money here we'll keep that in reserve. The company is now looking to take on another apprentice and James is thinking of moving to a new location with a higher visibility which shouldn't be hard. Well, that's it from Working Week. It's uh, time for us to head off now, mate. Back to Sherwood Forest. Yeah. Excellent. Did you get a receipt for these? Um, <laughs> <laughs> They'll never pay us. <laughs>